this place looks vaguely familiar, it's probably because you've seen one of the hundreds of cowboy films that have used these sets. Movies like Rio Bravo, Young Guns, The Three Amigos, the list's endless. This is old Tucson film studios, Arizona. A purpose-built cowboy town, slap bang in the middle of the desert. Hollywood's had a field day with westerns, although it hasn't often paid very much attention to the real history. But to be fair, it has made the West look really cool. I grew up watching films like these, about the lawman Wyatt Earp, the legendary Indian rebel Geronimo, sharpshooter Annie Oakley, and the amazing Buffalo Bill. But as a kid, I never really understood that these weren't just characters out of a movie, but actual real people. Their stories gave me a love of the West. And ever since, I've wanted to discover more about it. So that's what I'm going to do. I want to find out the truth behind the movies and TV shows, the dime novels and the tall stories. And to do that, I'm going back to the original sources. I'm going to raid an archive of lost images, real 3D photographs of cowboys and outlaws. These images, most of which have never been seen on television before, bring the real West back to life. But what kind of place was it? Who were the real heroes and villains? In those days, cowboy was a bad word. Was the West really full of outlaws drunk on rock gut whiskey? My favorite drink of the cowboys was a gin fizz toddy. And who got cut out of Hollywood's version of the West? There are only two categories of people in the West. There are whites and there are Indians. <laughs> That's it. These were larger-than-life characters who rewrote their own history. They were the first people to cash in on their celebrity. And in doing so, they each helped build a bigger legend, that of the Wild West itself. <laughs> What we refer to as the Wild West was a relatively short period of history, but its impact on America and indeed on world culture has been incredible. This was the time of the cowboys and the outlaws, folk heroes who became legends. But how did that happen? How did the men who conquered the Western wilderness go on to take over the world? This is the part of America we know as the Wild West. It was the last great chunk of the country to be colonized. For a long time, it was too remote to attract settlers. But by 1860, they finally began to arrive in their thousands, thanks to new rail links and offers from the government of free land. In one great surge, they filled the interior. This great migration fascinated people, particularly those who resisted it and stayed behind in the big cities. They hungered for stories and images about the new land of opportunity. That hunger was fed by photographers who sold stereo views, genuine 3D photographs of the West and the heroic men and women who lived there. They allowed people to view the frontier from the safety of their homes. They now provide us with an incredible archive of images. Most of them have never been seen on TV before in their original format, this one is a 3D shot of a man who would capitalise on this fascination with the West. His name was William Buffalo Bill Cody, and he was, quite frankly, a visionary. Bill would be instrumental in shaping the cowboy myths we still recognise today. This museum is a celebration of his life and of the world of cowboys and Indians. It was built in the town he founded and which still bears his name, Cody, Wyoming. 
Buffalo Bill is an extraordinary figure. And in a way, he encapsulates the strange relationship that we have with the Wild West. He was a real person with a real life that was turned into a fiction so elaborate that now we can't really distinguish between where the fantasy ends and the truth begins. But he was so gung-ho and brave and fairly wonderful that I suspect most of us don't really care. Cody still has his fans today. Historian Chris Enns is one of them. By the time he was 11, he was a freight wagon driver. By the time he was 13, he had ridden for the Pony Express. By the time he was 17, he had been a scout for the army in the Indian Wars. People wanted to know about him, wanted to be him, wanted to dress like him. He was uh, the greatest Western hero in my estimation. Born in Iowa in 1846, he earned his nickname as a prolific buffalo hunter for the Kansas Pacific Railroad. At the beginning of the 1800s, between 40 and 60 million buffalo grazed the Great Plains of America. But in the 1860s, hunters began harvesting them to sell for meat. Even when surrounded by industrial levels of slaughter, Cody proved to be an exceptional hunter. Cody was a killing machine of the Great Plains, shooting thousands of animals to supply the railway workers with meat. Little wonder the great herds were almost extinct by the end of the century. In 1869, with his reputation growing, he met a writer called Ned Buntline. Buntline specialised in spiced-up stories about real people. He wrote one about Cody called Buffalo Bill, the King of the Border Men. It was a huge success, and in 1872, he followed it up with a stage play. Buffalo Bill played himself in the show, which was called The Scouts of the Prairie. It was a smash, and as historian Paul Hutton explained, it gave Cody a taste for show business. He was a natural showman, incredibly good looking, and had a real flair for the dramatic, and his stage plays were very successful. In the years that followed, Cody began to live a double life. In the summer, he'd scout for the army and have adventures. Then in the winter, he'd return to the theater where he'd act out his exploits on stage. Year by year, he was mixing fact and fantasy and deliberately weaving a legend out of his own life. In 1876, the Sioux Indians, under the leadership of Sitting Bull, went to war with the US Army. Cody joined the 5th Cavalry as a scout and was fighting with them when he heard about the death of his friend, General George Custer, at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Bill wanted revenge. The Cheyennes were leaving the reservation and they were going up to join Sitting Bull's people. And they knew there was going to be a fight that day and Cody had risen and Interestingly, he had put on a Mexican vaquero outfit, one of his stage costumes. <laughs> and he went out in this stage costume, and off he goes. And this young warrior, a warrior named Yellowhair, who was also dressed for the occasion, he wore a swallowtail American flag as a breechcloth, comes riding out and he says, Pahaska, I know you, you know, come and, and meet me. And like two nights, out of a novel by Sir Walter Scott. They ride toward each other, and they both fire at the same time, and Cody gets Yellowhair's horse, and it goes tumbling down, but at the very same moment, Cody's horse goes down. It stepped in a, in a gopher hole, and he goes tumbling off the horse, does a somersault, rises up with his rifle, and just as Yellowhair rises, Cody kills him. Runs over, scalps him, raises up the scalp, declares it the first scalp for Custer. He immediately went back east. The new play was called The Red Right Hand, the first scalp for Custer. It was a sensation. Uh, people were horrified when uh, the scalp was displayed uh, in the theaters. Bill's act was shocking, but the audiences lapped it up. The trouble was, his version of the Wild West was fast disappearing. Railroads were crossing the Great Plains, and there were fewer and fewer places left where the freedom Bill was selling actually existed. One of them was Arizona. In 1877, a prospector named Ed Schifflin had gone there with an army patrol group. He'd used them as protection 
before heading into the desert to look for silver. When the soldiers heard that Ed was heading off into the Apache-filled hills to seek his fortune, they said all he'd find was a tombstone, but they were wrong. He hit one of the biggest discoveries of silver in the West. As a joke, he called the claim Tombstone. The town that grew up around the strike took the same name. These are 3D photos of old Tombstone, a place which legend has it was too tough to die. But did it deserve its outlaw reputation? I asked writer and Western historian Bob Bowes Bell. Well, Tombstone is an interesting case because we have this idea of this is frontier town and and people drank rot gut and they you know they would they couldn't uh, they didn't know any news unless somebody brought in a letter that came five weeks ago and stuff. But actually, Tombstone was very sophisticated. I looked up the newspaper for an ad. Kelly's Wine Room. 26 imported wines from Europe, their own microbrewery, imported beer from Colorado called Coors. The favorite drink of the cowboys was a gin fizz toddy. <laughs> and they had five billiard tables and a bowling alley. Now, isn't that incredible? It makes you wonder if they even heard a rot gut. Kelly's Wine Rooms wasn't the only establishment offering a little entertainment to Tombstone's residents. This is Tombstone's wonderful but infamous birdcage theatre. Now, you might think that those boxes up there are for people to see the show, but they're not. That is where the prostitutes worked. And if they got a bit of business, they'd just pull the curtains across. But there was another bit of business too, a great piece of entertainment that went on below the stage. In there, the West's longest ever running card game took place. It cost $1,000 to buy your way in. There was a three-day waiting list. You could play for as long as you like and then just go. And it lasted eight years, five months and three days. And one frequent visitor to it was Doc Holliday. Holliday was someone who did live up to the Hellraiser tag. He was an alcoholic dentist and a gambler who was quick with his temper and gun. He'd play a pivotal role in the legendary showdown which would immortalise Tombstone, the gunfight at the OK Corral. the TV show that I was obsessed with above all others when I was a kid. The life and legend of Wyatt Earp. It was based on the real-life marshal who has gone down in history for his part in the gunfight at the OK Corral. I always thought that Wyatt was the original cowboy hero and a paragon of virtue. That might not have been the case. Wyatt Earp is well known. He's well known in the Kansas cattle towns as a lawman. He's well known in the boom towns of the West, the mining camps, uh, as a sporty man, as it was called, always running horse races, running poker games, running uh, faro tables. Earp also worked as a bouncer and quite possibly as a pimp. He was once charged with living in a brothel and with assaulting a prostitute. He came to Tombstone because his brother Virgil was already working there as a deputy marshal, and Virgil had a problem with a gang of cattle rustlers known as the Cowboys. In those days, cowboy was a bad word, and in the Eastern press, there was the cowboy element in Arizona. They were running down into Mexico, rustling cattle and selling it to the mines in Tombstone and to the merchants up in Tucson, and the Earps were trying to put an end to that because the Earps represented Republican law and order. They'd come to Tombstone, they were going to clean the place up. The cowboys, dressed flamboyantly and colorfully, of course, and wild and carefree characters who are mostly from the South, are living the free life. And the Earps dressed all in black in city clothing. Of course, in the, in the television, he's always dressed in black. I'd never realised what a signifier that was as a northerner. It means everything. He's wearing city clothes. He's a city <sighs> guy. Earp represents progress. He represents the, the Republican ascendancy, and the cowboys are all Democrats, and they represent the rural South and uh, the bucolic West against the industrial East. 
So new America would clash with the old in the desert of Arizona and the dusty streets of Tombstone. For over a year, the Earps had been feuding with the cowboy gang, in particular two families, the McClowries and the Clantons, both ranchers who dealt in stolen cattle. On the 26th of October, 1881, Ike Clanton came to town armed and drunk and making threats about the Earps. He was joined by his brother Billy and Tom and Frank McClowry. Together, they gathered near the town's OK Corral. Now, in the movies, the Earps march heroically down the deserted streets to face their enemies. But is that how it really happened? Not according to Bob Bowes Bell. This is Hafford's Corner, and this is where the Earps were standing with Doc Holliday, and they were waiting, and people were running back and forth, and it really was more like a schoolyard fight, okay? There was probably 200 people here, half the town, because they knew there was going to be a fight that was going to come off. But that's not at all like you see in the movies. In, in the films, these streets are completely empty, except for these incredibly sexy gunslingers. They started walking up 4th Street, Wyatt and Virgil in the front, Doc and Morgan are in the back. Now, Morgan says, what are we going to do if they're on horseback? Because they didn't know how many people they were going to meet down there. There could be 100 cowboys down there. They've been hearing the rumors from everybody coming back and forth. And Wyatt Earp just looks over his shoulder and says, we'll shoot the horses. <laughs> so these are some guys with some sand, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, so they're walking along here. And uh, the people up ahead are running back and forth. People are trying, there's people running on the other side of the street. There's people behind them. And when they get up here to the post office, they make a left out into the middle of the street. Where are they going to? So they go into the middle of uh, Fremont Street, and that's when they spread out uh, four, four guys walking abreast. And that's the classic uh, legendary image that we have of the Earps, because yeah. they're, they're, they're ready to roll. Now, when they get down a little bit further, though, this, this is where Doc Holliday sees that they're in his side yard. He's rooming at Fly's boarding house, and they're waiting for him. It'd be like if you came home from work and there were some gangsters at, you know, in your side yard, you wouldn't like that. Well, and this is where Virgil made the big mistake, because the biggest mistake he made of his career is never take a drunk dentist to make an arrest, OK? <laughs> there, Doc, you took this. I don't look too steady this morning. Buckshot is able to hit more. I'm steadier than any of you. I had whiskey for breakfast. This is how you get into the OK Corral. This is the OK Corral. The fight is about to come off down here. They turned left right here, and they walked into an 18-foot wide space right here. <laughs> Which isn't the OK Corral. No, the OK Corral is 50 yards that way. The fight actually happened here in a side lot next to Fly's boarding house, but that is not going to fit on the movie marquee, is it? It should be called Gunfight Next to the OK Corral. Or behind the OK Corral. So it's at this point, OK, that Virgil walks right up to the cowboys, and he says, Are you men are under arrest? Drop your hands. And all of a sudden, somebody hears two clicks. Why, well, you I hold it. And he says, hold on, I didn't mean that. And what I believe the two clicks were is Doc Holliday pulled out that smoke wagon and made the two clicks on there. And the cowboys went, oh, crap. And everybody agrees that they went for their gun. There's only two of them were armed. They went for a gun. Now, Wyatt Earp, somewhere in here, says, you sons of bitches have been looking for a fight, and now you can have it. And Doc Holliday lunges with that shotgun and he fires at Tom McLowry, who was trying to get his rifle off of his horse. He shot under the right arm, okay, with a shotgun. So did he just fall over? He started running. You know, like if you shoot a deer, sometimes they'll run a mile. Yeah. Well, humans are the same way. It's not like in the movies where you go, oh, you caught me, and they go, oh, yeah, say goodbye to my mother. No, he started running, and he ran all the way down to that corner yeah. and collapsed. And then the fight becomes general. 30 shots in 30 seconds. Everyone's hit by gunfire. Only one man is unscratched. Who was that one man? Wyatt Earp. You got it. Tom and Frank McClowry and Billy Clanton were all killed in the fight. 
Their bodies were displayed in the window of the local undertakers. The gunfight that killed these men made Tombstone famous. But no one had really heard of the iconic battle till the 1930s. And the publication of Wyatt Earp's ghost-written and highly fictionalised autobiography. Herb died in 1929, aged 80. His book was published posthumously, and most of it was made up nonsense. But this reinvented version of events was seized upon by Hollywood. Movies finally made Wyatt a legend, but some of the big names of the West didn't have to wait that long to find fame. In the 1880s, the most famous resident of Arizona hadn't been anywhere near the OK Corral. He was the last great Indian rebel fighter, an Apache warrior whose name struck terror into white America, Geronimo. This is Geronimo, arguably the most feared Indian in Western history. He and his Apache warriors were one of the last tribal groups to surrender to the American government. In the cowboy movies I loved as a kid, the Apache were the ultimate bad guys, and Geronimo, the army's great nemesis. It seems that for once, the movie's got something right. How do the Apache Wars fit into the conquest of the West? Well, the Apache Wars are the last real battle, and uh, as one of the army officers says, we are engaged with some of the most intelligent natives on the, on the continent, and he was right. They were vicious, they were mean. Now today, it's politically incorrect to say these things about them, but we didn't name an attack helicopter after the, their beadwork, you know what I'm saying? These guys, these dudes were bad. The Apache had once roamed across Arizona and New Mexico, but by 1873, had been forced onto reservations by the American government. Some of their warriors refused to submit to this and escaped south across the border into Mexico. Geronimo was one of them. Although to us, Geronimo is the epitome of a savage, brave, slaughtering the white settlers, he was actually more of a scourge to the Mexicans than the American people, and with good reason. Mexican soldiers raided his camp when he and his braves were away trading. In the ensuing massacre, his wife, his mother and his children were all killed. After that, he pursued and murdered Mexicans in a relentless campaign of revenge attacks. Some estimates of the number of his victims runs to four or 500 people. Geronimo's raiders tortured and killed Americans too. Settlers in Arizona lived in constant fear of his braves. In his day, he was basically Osama bin Laden. He was a terrorist. He would be seen as a... And over the course of years, he's turned into a freedom fighter, which is an incredible uh, evolution for a character. Geronimo and his band were hunted for 28 years, and their pursuit tied up thousands of Mexican and American soldiers. But Geronimo couldn't run forever. In 1886, caught between the American and Mexican armies, Geronimo, along with his followers, faced a stark choice, surrender or die. On September the 3rd, he brought his band in from the desert. Technically a prisoner of war, Geronimo was sent to a reservation in Oklahoma, far from his Apache homeland. Nonetheless, he was allowed to travel to state fairs and expositions, where the audience clamored to see the man they'd once feared. He ended up on the circuit selling his autograph. He died with $10,000 in the bank. Think about that. Geronimo was a prisoner of war at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and he had $10,000 in the bank. And there's a story that he went to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's inaugural parade. They wanted him to come. So the Army said, we want you to come. And he said, well, you've got to pay for my horse. And they said, well, what's that going to cost? And he says, I'd need at least 150 bucks for you to get my horse there. I said, OK. So they sent him the check. He went down, put that in the bank. And then he went and got on the train, and he had a... Uh, Briefcase. They'd say, I'm Geronimo, I'm Geronimo, and they'd sell the pictures for a quarter, and then he would uh, sell the buttons off his coat, sell his hat, and he'd get on the train, and he'd open up the briefcase, and he'd pull out a sewing kit, and he'd sew new buttons on his coat. And uh, he got to Washington, and they said, well, where's your horse? And he said, yeah, you'll get me another one. And so they had to get him another horse. That guy was a businessman. 
Geronimo's surrender brought to a close four centuries of Indian warfare against European invaders. When a man who'd once been the terror of white settlers became a tourist attraction, it was clear the Wild West was at an end. However, the man who had made a fortune mythologizing the West was about to make it bigger than ever. By the 1880s, Buffalo Bill Cody had become a full-time entertainer. A stage actor for over a decade, he was about to burst free of the theater. He decided that he would do a combination rodeo, stage show, historical pageant that became the Wild West. In 1883, Cody assembled a band of real cowboys, Indians, and frontiersmen. They toured outdoor arenas, giving sharpshooting displays with live ammunition and showcasing their horse riding skills. More importantly, they reenacted historical events, including battles between American troops and the Cheyenne. Cody called this experience Buffalo Bill's Wild West. He helped shape the West and then he wanted to let people know about the creation of the West, people who were losing sight of that. Looking at Cody's cast now, it seems very progressive. The show featured riders from all over the world and around 80 female performers. The one everyone remembers is Phoebe Ann Moses, better known as Annie Oakley. Annie was the fifth of nine children and was raised in a log cabin in Ohio. After her father died, she began shooting and trapping to feed her family. She was soon supplying game to local businesses and by the age of 15 had paid off the family mortgage. Her guns are one of the star exhibits at the Cody Firearms Museum, where I met curator Ashley Levinsky. So, Ashley, yes. one of these rifles belonged to Annie Oak. Yes, can you guess which one? Well, I would say that one, but I don't know if I'm yes, right. Yes, you are correct. Um, both of these guns actually were used in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. But this firearm is a Winchester Model 1873, and this was actually used by Buffalo Bill himself. What's unique about these, both of these firearms is that it's smoothbore. This is a rifle, but they converted it so that it would fire shot instead of the standard projectile. Why did they do that? It was more of a safety measure for the arenas that they were in. The shot doesn't spray as far, and so it was just to keep the audience safe. And plus, you know, when they're doing their feats, a lot of times shot is just a better way to do it. So this one's Annie Oakley's? This one is Annie Oakley's. And this is a different model. This is a Winchester model 1892. What's so charming about this is it really feels like it's been feminized. It's so much lighter. It's so it's prettier, isn't it? it well, yes, it is. A, it's got a nice engraving on it. And so it's a much prettier gun. But I, I want to say that Annie Oakley could fire a 73 like no one else as well. Why have you given us some Christmas decorations? Well, the Christmas decorations are actually glass balls. And this is what they were shooting at, believe it or not. Wow. So Annie Oakley was shooting at one of those? Yes. On a horse? Or, or a bicycle. A bike. <laughs> so she really was that good a shot? She was a fantastic shot, although I have to say I probably wouldn't want the job of cleaning up the shards of glass after that was done. But she really was just an extraordinary exhibition shooter. And she had a quote of her own that basically said that when a man did it, you know, he was a great shot, but when she did it, she, it was a trick. Was this Annie Oakley's? This was Annie Oakley's wig. And now it's got a couple of different stories that go around with it. Uh, the public story is that she was in a train wreck, and so she needed a, a wig for her hair after the complications with the accident. That's the public story. But the uh, family story, Annie Oakley's family, claims that she was actually in a steam bath for too long and that turned her hair gray. And uh, the, the reason for that argument and the family's kind of justification of it was Annie Oakley was the picture of this demure, feminine, conservative woman, and she didn't want people to, you know, picture her naked. What do you think of her? Annie Oakley is just a fantastic representative of the shooting world and of women shooters. She could shoot like any other guys out there, and she could shoot any gun that you put in front of her. And she actually, as a kid, haunted for subsistence to support her family. And so just an amazing shot, an overall, you know, impressive and wonderful person. With star performers like Annie and a cast of gun-toting, hard-riding cowboys, Bill conquered America. 
His next challenge was to take the show overseas. By transporting the Wild West to Europe, Cody would turn the cowboy into an American icon. But amidst all of the pomp and showbiz, some people in the West were about to be written out of history. In 1876, the Sioux chief Sitting Bull was at war with the US Army. He masterminded the Battle of Little Bighorn and the killing of General Custer. Custer had been a friend of Buffalo Bill, and the showman had headed west to avenge his murder. But within a decade, he'd be reenacting the last stand on stage and inviting Sitting Bull to tour with him. The Wild West had now blurred fantasy and reality to a bizarre extent. Bill's show established ideas of cowboys and Indians that still exist to this day. But with such a narrow focus, it was inevitable that some people would be written out of the story completely. It came as a shock to me when I heard there were black cowboys. I think it comes to a shock for a number of people. Uh, even with the movies that have been made so far and the fact that blacks are no longer completely absent from the West, a lot of people have the image of an uh, American West where blacks didn't exist. Were there many? There were a number of blacks who made their living as cowboys. There were blacks who were slaves in places like South Carolina and other places as well that did the work of cowboys. There were blacks who came, of course, who were free people as well. But a number of folks who made themselves into the West came as slaves because slavery stretched across the United States on into Texas. And so you had a number of black people who came that way. And some were cowboys. They didn't raise cotton, they didn't grow crops, they just mainly punched cattle. So do you think black cowboys would have received a degree of camaraderie or would they have been on the receiving end of a lot of hostility? Both of the things are true. There were cowboys that lived most of their lives and they just experienced camaraderie. They worked with white cowboys, they were friends, uh, both on the range and when they went to town. And, and of course there were times when black cowboys ran into trouble. Remember, a lot of the cowboys are from the South. They come out of a southern tradition, uh, and they weren't just happy about black cowboys. So you might line, wind up at a ranch where uh, you might be run off. You could get in some trouble. You might even get shot, for that matter. Uh, in other places, of course, black cowboys worked very much in harmony and in tandem with the, with, the, with the white cowboys. So by and large, I think there was a lot of camaraderie, especially when they're driving cattle up a trail. You're talking about 11 or 12 men that are going to be together for a month or two, moving cattle from Texas to points north. There, there's an independence almost basically required. There's a required interdependence because you're depending on that person for, their, for your life, for, not just for your livelihood, but for your life. There are still some people out there who find it impossible to believe that there were black cowboys, aren't there? If the cowboy is the iconic image of America, is that an image that some people want to see as a black man or would want to see as a, a Mexican or want to see as an Indian? No. They would not. You know, there are only two categories of people in the West. There are whites and there are Indians. <laughs> That's it. I think, again, the Mexican disappears, the Chinese disappears, and blacks disappear. The version of Western history that was being sold by Buffalo Bill Cody may not have told the whole story, but it was incredibly popular. So in 1887, Cody was encouraged to take his show across the Atlantic. It was a move that would turn the Wild West into a global phenomenon. This magnificent poster records a pivotal moment in the career of William Buffalo Bill Cody. It commemorates his royal command performance in front of Queen Victoria in 1887 at the American Exhibition. To get a taste of the show that Queen Victoria enjoyed, I took a stroll behind the scenes at the Buffalo Bill Museum with curator Jeremy Johnston. I'd thought that the museum was just the stuff upstairs. I didn't realise you had these countless drawers and cupboards down here. We have over 9,000 objects just in the Buffalo Bill Museum alone, and that does not count the rest of the Buffalo Bill Centre of the West. So, would you like to see a few? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it says WF Cody on it. I see the whole cupboards devoted to him. <laughs> This is about as close as you will ever come to going through Buffalo Bill's wardrobe closet. <laughs> what have you got? Let's see. Just to show you what kind of showman he truly was. <laughs> that is outrageous, isn't it? 
Yes, this is a coat he typically wore during performances. The buttons are made in London. The beadwork and the leather work were completed by Lakota women. So he would have worn this as he rode into the arena. And as you can imagine, the sunlight hitting the beadwork and the white buckskin, it would have just been a, a stunning opening. I'm here. Elvis is alive. He is in the building. <laughs> <laughs> have you got anything from the time he was in London? Yes. Get up here. This is really quite a stunning article presented to Buffalo Bill Cody by Queen Victoria. It was originally intended to be a watch fob, but then he converted it to a pin for his wife, Louisa, when he returned to the States. If you look, this bloodstone, really quite stunning. You can see the inscription there. Her Majesty Queen Victoria to Colonel William F. Cody, June 25th, 1892. Why did he come to Britain? I really think he viewed this as a crowning achievement, performing in London as a crowning achievement of his career. Many past actors had succeeded in London, including P.T. Barnum with the display of Tom Thumb. So for him, this was really bringing international attention to Buffalo Bill's Wild West. What was his impact on the Europeans of the time? Oh, amazing impact, one that we still see to this day. All those iconic images of the American West we're familiar with through film and television. The attack of the Homestead Cabin, the attack of the Deadwood Stagecoach, Custer's Last Stand, the American Cowboy as Hero were always, were really perfected by Buffalo Bill and through Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Well, it certainly worked because for me as a child in the 50s, I was watching cowboys on television and the movies and I knew as much about those stories as I'm sure any American kid did. Sure, sure. Yeah, and it's really quite amazing how he transferred the American Cowboy into a hero because in 1883, when he started Buffalo Bill's Wild West, many people viewed cowboys as a threat for example, when President Chester A. Arthur came out to Yellowstone in 1883, the biggest fear was not grizzly bears. The fear was cowboys would kidnap the president and hold him for blackmail. After Cody, the cowboy is now the American hero. Enough theorizing. Show me some more stuff. You bet. A few more uh, garments. <laughs> it is so camp. <laughs> Notice the thread work on this. This is all a fine thread throughout here, completed by Matee Indians in Canada, and it's made out of caribou hide. You might find this of interest. This is not officially an object. It's considered to be a prop, but it was donated to us by William F. Cody's descendants under the condition that our visitors, our guests, would be able to say they have worn Buffalo Bill's hat. So. Would you like oh, yeah. to try it on? Thank you. There is a resemblance, isn't there? Buffalo Bill toured Europe eight times in all, appearing before Kaiser Wilhelm, the future King George V, and the Pope. His heroic vision of America embedded itself in the consciousness of millions of Europeans. When Cody died in 1917 at the age of 70, the news was met with shock and grief across the globe. Passing of the great Buffalo Bill even knocked World War I off the front pages. His legacy, however, would long outlive him. In 1903, American audiences got excited about a new kind of movie. It starred the actor Bronco Billy Anderson, and it was a smash hit. In fact, it remained one of the biggest grossing films for the next decade. It was called The Great Train Robbery, and it was the world's first ever cowboy film. But its success meant that studios all over the country wanted a slice of it. The Great Train Robbery was unlike anything audiences had seen before. It was a bold, dynamic action movie that kept viewers on the edge of their seats. Soon, rival studios were churning out hundreds of silent westerns. 
many featuring genuine cowboys turned actors. And all these pictures owed a debt to the original Western showman. The screenwriters, the directors, as kids had all seen Buffalo Bill's show. And so they were very influenced by, you know, the attack on the Deadwood stage, the attack on the settler's cabin, Custer's last stand. And so uh, Cody certainly created all of the conventions that would be repeated over and over and over again in many ways. Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, John Wayne, these are all the children and grandchildren of Buffalo Bill. Thanks to Hollywood, the cowboys were bigger than ever. However, the West that had spawned them had now died out. In 1893, a special meeting of the American Historical Association was held at the Chicago World's Fair. At it, the eminent historian Frederick Jackson Turner announced that after 400 years, the American frontier was finally closed. And with it, the first period of American history was at an end. My own journey through the history of the West is drawing to a close too. I came here looking for a place I'd seen in the movies to find out about the life and times of my childhood heroes. And what I've discovered is that the people who came west really were remarkable. They had to be, as historian Tom Hatch explains. It was a time where the people were courageous and it was a place where the resources were just endless. There was so much there, a bounty to be had but it was hard work, and all the people that came out there were, were quite brave to be able to, uh, to stick it out and stay there. If you're leaving and you're going west, well, something's either wrong with you or something's very right with you, but you're certainly a very adventurous spirit, and you're certainly someone who is determined to make a better life. We'll never know anything like the frontier again where a country was just being settled and all the possibilities that go with it. But this was no untouched virgin territory they were settling. Two million Native Americans had once called this continent their home. For them, the Wild West was a tragedy, the final chapter in the European invasion of their homeland. There's a lot to be angry about, and it started back in what is called, laughably, the Indian Wars, because we didn't start the wars, although it's called that. We were not the invaders, we were the defenders. As the West disappeared, those who'd helped tame it, like Buffalo Bill, clung on to its memory. They told and retold its story, and in the process, forged America's great creation myth. There's a real West, and there's the Dream West and Americans have long been enchanted by the Dream West. The notion of the cowboy is powerful. In some ways, we can say the classical period, the cowboy is over, but I don't think the cowboy, the cowboy will live forever. The cowboy period only lasted a couple of decades. But it's become one of the defining stories in the history of America. We're all captivated by it, aren't we? I know I am, which is why I'm going to revert to the most massive cliche and ride off into the distance. Coming up on Discovery, a remote island is proved too difficult for homesteaders to settle on, so a first-timer needs all the help he can get next in Alaska, the last frontier.